Kuala Lumpur, May 21. While most Malaysians remember Tan Sri Richard Malanjam as the first East Malaysian to be appointed Chief Justice, the top judge, who retired recently has also been praised for upholding the federal constitution. Retired Court of Appeal Judge Datu Kishamuddin Yunus recently told Malay Mail that Malanjum is a fearless and staunch defender of the integrity of the federal constitution and fundamental liberties. He highlighted five of Malanjum's most significant court rulings which he said made important contributions to the positive developments of constitutional law and also noted that he does not hesitate to write dissenting or separate judgments when he considers it his judicial duty to do so. The dissenting, separate judgments at the federal court. 1. The Lena Joy Case 2007. What was this case about? A woman named Lena Joy, who had renounced Islam and embraced Christianity, applied to remove the word Islam from her identity card. The National Registration Department, NRD, refused her application, insisting that she must produce a certificate of apostasy issued by the Sharia court. The case went through the High Court, the Court of Appeal and even the Federal Court, where the NRD's position was upheld. The Federal Court's decision was a two-to-one ruling, with Melanjam disagreeing with then-Chief Justice Ahmad Faris Sheikh Abdul Halim and fellow Judge Aladdin Mode Sheriff. Justice Richard Melanjam further held that the insistence by the National Registration Department for a Certificate of Apostasy from the Federal Territory Syria Court was not only unlawful, but also unreasonable, as the Syria Court in the Federal Territory had no statutory power to adjudicate on the issue of apostasy. Moreover, apostasy is not an issue that is exclusively within the realm of the Syria Court. The issue of apostasy involves complex questions of constitutional importance and thus the civil court should not have declined jurisdiction to hear the application. 2. The Herald Case, 2014. What was this case about? The Home Minister in January 2009 banned the Catholic Church's internal newsletter Herald from using the Arabic word for God, Allah, in its Bahasa Malaysia section. The High Court ruled the ban to be unlawful and unconstitutional, while the Court of Appeal reversed the decision by ruling the Home Minister had the power to impose the ban as a condition for the renewal of Harold's publication permit. As one of his grounds he pointed out that it was an undisputed fact that the Herald newsletter that contained the word Allah had been in circulation for the past 14 years before the imposition of the minister's decision, and that there was no evidence shown of prejudice to public order during that period, and that the use of the word Allah was not prohibited in other publications such as the Al-Khattab and the Sikh Holy Book. According to Justice Richard Malanjam, there were merits in the applicant's contention that the minister's decision contravened Article 11, 1, and 3 of the federal constitution, and Therefore leave to appeal to the federal court ought to be granted, whereas in this case leave to appeal to the federal court was refused by the federal court. What was this case about? Ko was a child accused of intentionally killing his tuition teacher's daughter and was found guilty of murder. Acting under Section 97 2 of the Child Act 2001, the trial court ordered Ko to be detained at the pleasure of the young deeper Tuana Gong. The Court of Appeal struck down Section 97 2 4, being in violation of the doctrine of separation of powers, which is one of the basic features of the federal constitution, Hishamuddin explained. The federal court reversed the Court of Appeal's decision, with Melanjam writing a separate judgment that gave different reasons from the four other federal court judges for the same ruling. Hishamuddin explained that the four other judges had held that a law made by Parliament could not be struck down for violating the doctrine of separation of powers, as the federal constitution did not have provisions expressly setting out the doctrine. Hishamuddin described the majority judgment as adopting a literal interpretation of the federal constitution's Article 121, which he said was an interpretation inconsistent with the spirit of the Constitution. In Hishamuddin's own words regarding Melanium's bold but separate judgment, 
In this case Justice Richard Melanja maintained that notwithstanding Article 121 of the Federal Constitution, the judicial power of the judiciary remains intact in the Constitution, that the jurisdiction and powers of the courts cannot be confined to federal law, and that the doctrines of separation of powers and the independence of the judiciary are basic features of our Constitution. Having provided a brief recap of the cases where Melanja made his differing opinions known, Hishamuddin said it was no surprise that Melanja had upon appointment as Chief Justice wasted no time in advising federal court and court of appeal judges of their duty to do the same. Hishamuddin said Melanjum had advised the judges that they have a judicial duty to deliver dissenting or separate judgments whenever the judges in deciding over a case are of the firm opinion that they do not agree with the majority decision, instead of merely concurring with the majority just for the sake of convenience or expediency the unanimous rulings at the federal court. Why this case was important, Melanjum was part of the three-member federal court panel chaired by then-judge Datuk Sari Gopal Ram, who delivered the unanimous ruling in this case. With this historic landmark decision, Hishamuddin said the federal court took a bold step forward in relation to the judiciary's role in protecting fundamental liberties, especially the constitutional right to freedom of speech. The federal court held that Parliament could not impose a restriction on freedom of speech in any manner it deemed fit, and that any restriction imposed on freedom of speech by Parliament must be a reasonable restriction. Hishamuddin explained, the federal court also went further to hold that the fundamental rights guaranteed by Part II of the federal constitution form part of the basic structure of the federal constitution thereby giving recognition for the first time, but albeit partially, to the doctrine of basic structure as enunciated by the Supreme Court of India in the landmark case of Kesavan and de Bharati. The State of Kerala, he said, describing this as a remarkable development in the law, in contrast to the apex court's previous position in Lokui Chun v. Government of Malaysia. What this case was about, Hindu mother Amandira Gandhi had challenged her Muslim convert ex-husband's unilateral conversion to Islam of their three children born in a civil marriage, succeeding in the High Court before the Court of Appeal reversed it. Hishamuddin said the federal court had in this landmark case, correctly overturned, the Court of Appeal's majority judgment, when ruling in Indira's favor by holding that the children's Unilateral conversion to Islam was unlawful and invalid due to the ex-husband and the Parak religious authorities' breaching of the provisions in the administration of the religion of Islam, Parak, Enactment 2004. Hishamuddin highlighted the federal court's ruling that the conversions were unconstitutional for breaching the federal constitution's Article 12 4, and how the apex court d. now correctly interpreted the word parent in the provision to mean both a child's father and mother if they are both still alive. The interpretation of the word parent was a crucial point to determine if both parents' consent are required for the conversion to Islam of a child born in a non-Muslim marriage. Secondly, the federal court in its landmark judgment rightly seized the opportunity to clarify the limits of the jurisdiction of the Syria court, Hishamuddin said, describing it as a long overdue move as the Sharia court's jurisdiction limits had been much misunderstood following the Article 121 1A Amendment in 1988. Hishamuddin said even civil court judges had misunderstood this by erroneously declining jurisdiction over matters in favor of the Sharia court, but said the apex court in Indira's case has now made clear that the Sharia court's jurisdiction must be provided for under the relevant state laws and is limited to items listed constitutionally under the state's jurisdiction. The federal court also ruled that Article 121 1A is not a blanket exclusion of the civil court's jurisdiction whenever a matter related to Islamic law arises, and that the civil court's inherent powers of judicial review and interpretation of the Constitution or laws cannot be removed by Article 121 1A, he said.
Hishamuddin also noted the federal court ruling reaffirmed several constitutional law principles of great importance, namely that judicial power is vested exclusively in the civil high courts via Article 121 and the features of the Constitution's basic structures such as judicial power and particularly the power of judicial review cannot be removed by Parliament via a constitutional amendment. Hishamuddin said these five judgments are part of Melanium's legacy which he will be remembered for. George Varghese, the immediate past president of the Malaysian Bar who was in office during Melanium's tenure as Chief Justice, said the latter's dissenting judgment in P.P. V. Ko Wa Kwan, where he defended the doctrines of separation of powers and independence of the judiciary, was outstanding. Varghese also told Malay Mail that another landmark ruling by Melanjum was the federal court's April 5, 2019 decision in two drug trafficking cases, where the double presumption of guilt in the Dangerous Drugs Act DDA, was held to be unconstitutional for violating Articles 5, 1, and 8, 1 of the federal constitution. What the cases were about, two foreigners were separately found with drugs hidden inside their bags. The trial judges had in both cases ruled that the presumption that they have possession and knowledge of the drugs under Section 37 DDA applies since their custody and control of the drugs were proven, and that the presumption that they were trafficking in drugs under Section 37 DDA also applies since the drug's weight exceeded the weight listed in the DDA. The two foreigners were convicted of drug trafficking which carries the mandatory death penalty, and had appealed unsuccessfully at the Court of Appeal before further appealing to the federal court. Quick history, the federal court had in the drug trafficking case of Mohammed Hassan v. Public Prosecutor, 1998, found that the presumption of possession under Section 37d cannot be used to invoke the presumption of trafficking under Section 37 da, as it would be harsh and oppressive against the accused. Parliament then introduced Section 37A under the DDA which came into force in February 2014 to overcome the effect of the 1998 court ruling, with this new provision saying that a presumption may be used together with another presumption. The Apex Court explained that Section 37A of the DDA allows for a double presumption, where an accused is presumed to have possession and knowledge of the drug under Section 37D. Once the prosecution proves that they had custody and control of the drug, with this deemed possession, then used to invoke a further presumption of drug trafficking under Section 37D. If the drug quantity is more than the weight limit in DDA, this means the prosecution only needs to prove the accused's custody and control of the drug at a drug's weight to make a prima facie case for drug trafficking, with the accused then placed under legal burden to disprove the double presumptions on a balance of probabilities. The federal court said this legal burden is a grave erosion to the presumption of innocence covered under the federal constitution's Article 5 1, which provides that no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except in accordance with the law. The federal court said the application of the double presumptions carries a real risk of an accused being convicted of drug trafficking in circumstances where there remains a significant reasonable doubt in relation to the offense's main elements, noting that the use of presumed possession to invoke presumed trafficking was a grave departure from the general rule that the prosecution has to prove an accused's guilt beyond reasonable doubt. The federal court struck down Section 37A for being unconstitutional due to its severe incursion of the accused's right under Article 5 1 and for failing to meet the requirement under Article 8 1 to be proportionate. The federal court then quashed the two accused's drug trafficking convictions, substituting it with jail terms for possession of drugs.